Good morning. I see we have 62 people here. And so I'll just start my introduction. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Julia Meltzer. I'm the director of Clock Shop and I'm here to open us up. Um, we're gonna be talking about history, women and archives and Delilah L. Beasley. Um, I'm the founding director of Clock Shop. And if you don't know Clock Shop, a little bit about us. We're an arts organization based in Elysian Valley in Los Angeles. and we believe in the transformative power of art and culture to connect us to the land on which we live. And with that, I'm gonna do a land acknowledgement at the beginning. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. In this space of virtual learning and exploration, we acknowledge that we are living on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva and Ohlone peoples. We're including Oakland here because I know there's many people from that territory as well. We acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva and Ohlone peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Tongvar and Ohlone land that we are engaging in these learning processes on occupied land. I wanna thank the Autry Museum and especially Brittany Campbell and all the staff at the Autry for extending the invitation to partner on this conversation in the context of a current exhibition at the Autry, What's Her Story, Women in the Archives. What's Her Story looks behind the scenes to share how the work of archivists brings the more hidden narratives to light weaving in and out of primary source evidence to color in details, amplify voices, and begin the discovery of women's stories. Uh, I think we're gonna put in the, UR, in the chat, there it is, how you could access the exhibition online because unfortunately it's not possible to visit the Autry in person right now. So today we have with us an incredible group of women who will be talking about Delilah L. Beasley, a black journalist and writer who wrote The Negro Trailblazers of California, which was published in 1919. In 2019, Clock Shop published this gem of a book that I have right here, Trailblazer, Delilah, everyone's got their copy, Delilah Beasley's California, as part of an exhibition we co-curated at the Huntington called Beside the Edge of the World. And in researching for this exhibition, we learned that the Huntington has in their collection an original copy of Beasley's book, The ne Negro Trailblazers of California. And given that 2019 was the 100 year anniversary of this text, it seemed like a perfect moment to delve deeper into Beasley's history and her life and the incredible work that she did. Dana Johnson, who joins us today, was one of the writers who Clock Shop invited to participate in the exhibition. Her short story, Our Endless Ongoing, is based on Beasley's life. In addition, Anna Cecilia Alvarez wrote a nonfiction essay, which is part of the book. Last March, we were scheduled to be in Oakland at the Oakland History Room with Dorothy Lazard, Anna, and Dana all together to talk about our book, but the pandemic shut us down. So we persevered and we are here today, virtually all together to follow up on that event that we were so looking forward to. We're grateful that we can gather here today during Black History Month to talk more about this significant part of our history as Californians. And I wanna especially thank Jennifer Watts, Janet Duckworth, Jenny Hirons, all of whom made this book possible. I'm honored to have Marnie Campbell here with us today who will moderate this conversation. Marnie L. Campbell is an associate professor at Loyola Marymount University in the Department of African American Studies. She earned her PhD in history at UCLA and her book entitled Making Black Los Angeles, Gender, Class and Community, 1850 to 1917, which was published in 2016, emphasizes issues of labor, politics and culture through the intersection of this diverse community with other communities of color. She also has completed an extensive database of almost every African-American family in Los Angeles from 1850 to 1910. So she is especially um, a perfect person to guide us in this discussion. Marnie, thank you, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Julia. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce our panelists and then we'll begin our conversation. Ana Cecilia Alvarez is a writer born in Mexico City and raised in Southern Florida. 
Her essays and criticism have appeared in several publications, including N Plus One Magazine, Book Forum, The New Inquiry, and Real Life. She studied art history and feminist theory at Brown University and earned an MFA in creative writing from the California Institute of the Arts. And she teaches and lives in Berkeley, California. Lindsay Lee Eichenberger is an educator, zine maker, and future high school history teacher. She has led zine workshops and given lectures about the power of self-publishing, working with students as young as preschool to teachers in professional development workshops. She has also developed and produced multiple youth programs and is currently an MA candidate at Cal State LA, where she enjoys discussing the pitfalls of banking education and finding new and exciting ways to disrupt the teacher as authority paradigm. Lindsay lives in Los Angeles, where she is from. Dana Johnson is the author of the short story collection, um, In the Not Quite Dark. She is also the author of Break Any Woman Down, winner of the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction and the novel Elsewhere, California. Her most recent publication is Our Endless Ongoing, a fictional account of the life of Delilah Beasley. Born and raised in and around Los Angeles, she is a professor of English at the University of, Cali of Southern California, where she serves as the director of the PhD in Creative Writing and Literature Program. And Dorothy Lazard manages the Oakland History Room of the Oakland Public Library, where she provides reference services to a variety of researchers, including genealogists, architects, professors, and and writers. For the past decade, she has hosted popular history programs, mounted exhibits highlighting Oakland history, and written articles for the Oakland Heritage Alliance News. Her mission is to make more of Oakland's history accessible to a local, national, and international audience, and she contributes to a fuller interpretation of California history. She holds a master's degree in library and information studies from UC Berkeley and masters of fine arts and a master's of fine arts degree in creative nonfiction from Goucher College in Baltimore. Besides East, East Bay history, Lazard writes on the use of public space in African American history. So I'm so glad that we're here having this conversation today and I thought maybe we could start by talking about how you all came to know um, about Delilah Beasley's work and what, and what caught your attention um, about her. And I think we should start with Anna, if you don't mind. And then after that, if, if you all, if everyone else could just jump in, that would be great. Thank you, Marnie. Um, so I was first introduced to Delilah through um, Julia Meltzer. She described um, the project that Clock Shop did with the Huntington um, where we encountered um, a copy of Delilah's um, The Negro Trailblazers. And at the time I was fortunate enough to be um, working at Clock Shop and Julia just kind of came um, to me with this invitation to um, spend a Tuesday, every Tuesday for a couple weeks um, in the Huntington, um, researching um, Delilah and writing an essay um, on her to accompany this publication. And I think what um, initially struck me most about her was the fact that I had never heard of her um, and seemingly to for um, you know, for Julia, it kind of, it, it seemed like it was something that we had, um, you know, not necessarily stumbled upon, but, you know, it was, it was a discovery. And I think that was the first thing that caught my attention of, you know, why, why haven't I heard of Delilah yet? Um, I will go next. Um, I also, I currently work at Clock Shop and was working there when this project was sort of being incubated 
um, and when it came to Clock Shop's attention that um, that this original copy of Negro Trailblazers of California was at the Huntington, and I sort of was learning about Delilah Beasley sort of through like just like osmosis. Like I was in the office, me and me and Anna were desk mates. We sat next to each other, so I was like, as she was learning things, I was sort of learning them because we were all sort of just learning about this person again, like Anna said, for the first time, how do we not know about this history and this person? And so I was sort of absorbing it from Anna as she was learning it. And of course, reading, you know, Dana's story and Anna's essay as they were coming in before they made it into the book officially, um, which is how I was made familiar um, with Delilah L. Beasley and her work. Um, yeah, so that's how I heard about her was sort of at Clock Shop through this project as well. Thank you. Dana, how about you? Uh, yes, uh, thanks to Julia. Julia uh, sent me Delilah's way. And of course, like so many people, I had never heard of her before. Um, and so once I had access to a digital copy of the Negro Trailblazers of California, I started reading her life's work, which was incredible and mind blowing and um, transformative for me. And um, so that's how I learned about her. Um, feels sort of just very lucky. Um, thank you, Julia. Julia. And Dorothy. Hi, everybody. I learned about Delilah Beasley through my work in the Oakland History Center. Uh, we've renamed it Oakland History Center, by the way. Uh, or pretty early on, I came to this uh, center in 2009 and I was kind of astounded because I, I didn't know about her either. And I grew up reading the Oakland Tribune and uh, growing up really studying African-American history, but um, discovering her made me realize how much history we don't know about our immediate surroundings. Uh, I've always, I was a former journalism student when I was in college and, um, and so I was just kind of really inspired to learn that so early in our, our city's history that there was this woman, this black woman who was recording history uh, for us and uh, for the Tribune of all, all places too. Uh, I wouldn't have guessed that because I know the Tribune as being a very conservative paper. So that was kind of like a mind blower. And, and another thing was just learning how many people didn't know about her, but also how many people did know about her and who enthusiastically shared information about her with me. So I was really fortunate to uh, be in the position I was in to discover her. Thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up a little bit, um, and Dorothy, I wanna start with you about um, sort of thinking about Delilah Beasley as an ancestor um, to the collection um, of, of how we tell stories, right? How, do, how does she exemplify um, both, um, you know, kind of collecting um, the history, but also telling the story? Well, I think uh, her Negro Trailblazers, that book, gives us a real, a perfect example of how important it is to not just look at a people or a place as this one thing, you know, looked at through this particular prism of maybe privilege or class or something like that. She included everyone in her book. So she kind of democratized, I think, um, what history could be and kind of reinterpret it for me, um, what or reaffirm for me what history could be uh, by saving those stories of people who may never have got into the papers in their lives, um, preserving those stories in her book or in her column and talking about uh, both civic and fraternal and uh, social organizations, uh, that may never have gotten any play in the mainstream press. So she, I think, is an ancestor in that she kind of broadened our view of what history could be. It doesn't have to be 
written by a man. It doesn't have to be about white people. It doesn't have to be about famous uh, or moneyed or landed gentry or anything like that. Um, and so in that way, I see her as a pioneer herself. She wrote a lot about the pioneers of Cal early California, but I think she's a pioneer in that regard as well. Yeah, thank you. I know, um, I know all of those um, collections um, that all of the collecting that she did and all of the writing that she did was very helpful to me in my own research because there was nowhere else that I could find such stories. Um, and so I wanna ask Dana about sort of um, when you have somebody who has done all of this um, collection of these stories, how does, how does that then inform um, the creative writing process? Or how does it even you know, inform your own writing process? Well, her version, her more accurate version of California than the version I grew up with was super illuminating. So there are things about California that are so mythologized that sort of become the lore of the place. And what she really made me think about was again, um, how, how black people contributed to what California is. And the kind of history of California, particularly in terms of slavery. Um, I was talking about this the other day, um, just the idea that my, my parents migrated from Tennessee, like a lot of uh, black folks did to Los Angeles. And so growing up, my idea of Los Angeles was just that, you know, it was this utopia land of honey, you know, everybody's free, everything's wonderful, everything, everybody's equal. And what, she, what the Negro Trailblazers of California did because of her deep, deep comprehensive history illustrated to me how complicated uh, California's relationship is with slavery in particular. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated by that. And so I don't know when writing the story of trying to document something about her life and her research through fiction, I just wanted to be sure to hit all of those notes, to have all of those nuances come together because I wanna talk about her, but I wanna talk about California and I wanna talk about how she taught me about California. So all of that was uh, happening in the fiction and um, still to this day, I'm thinking about the Negro Trailblazers because it's so dense, it's so detailed. And there are all these other things that I feel like I wanna to get to. I'm not sure if I ever will in my fiction, but I'm just so thrilled to have, I have a digital copy of the book. So I have it with me and I will be returning to it um, again and again. Yeah, I, um, I, when I'm reading the book, my um, reprint copy, I have so many sticky notes in it um, that are sort of, uh, categorized right thematically so I could go back to it when I need to um, so it's a great reference I think for um, the historian but also for um, the writers and the educators and I was wondering also um, Anna and Lindsay um, if you want if you would talk a little bit about how how Delia, uh, work like Delilah Beasley's inform the work that you do. So maybe Anna, you could start us off and then, and then Lindsay next. Sure, um, this is a little bit of a maybe indirect response, but it's, um, it's a thought that um, what Dana shared also sparked within me um, in terms of just um, the, the density and the um, kind of like kaleidoscopic plethora of stories that Dana um, contributes, I think, um, especially in the time when her book was published, which was in 1919, she kind of got um, a lot of um, criticism from other academic historians at the time, basically, you know, saying like this, like this isn't a proper work of history because, you know, she's just kind of, you know, throwing like the kitchen sink, so to speak, into um, what she amasses. And, um, 
I kind of, and what I, I mentioned this in the essay that I write about her that I think, um, you know, one, that criticism maybe came from this viewpoint of, you know, this is a woman who's not trained as a historian who hasn't, who, you know, didn't study um, in a university setting and maybe doesn't know um, the, um, I don't know, you know, the prescriptions of what is proper um, historical writing. Um, which is ironic because she, um, the, the, the historian who kind of offered this criticism actually published an article of Delilah's in his journal. Um, and so anyways, there's, there's a way in which um, that made me reflect on how Delilah's own almost like stylistic, like I like to think of her as a, a writer as well and the kind of stylistic choices that she was making in Trailblazers. I think sometimes like we can maybe like, I think her critics kind of saw that as like, oh, she maybe just wasn't learned or practiced or, um, you know, like just didn't know how to write proper history. But I actually think that it was like, she was making um, stylistic decisions and, and kind of making like a statement of what, um, what history um, should mean and what history could be like. And she was doing that not only in in her research, but also in just how she wrote, how she organized the text. And it ends up the, the texture and the experience of reading it ends up being so different from what we might um, kind of expect to see in a history book. Um, so that's just like one, like one kind of, I think, um, interesting thing that I kind of take from her is um, just, yeah, the, the, the 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 form and and the the thickness in her writing like it is not is not accident or is not um yeah it, you know it, it kind of came with intention and um formally um offers us a different definition of um what history um could be yeah and um just to interject really quickly before we um come to lindsay um, that historian that Anna's talking about is Carter, is Carter D. Woodson, and the, um, it was the Journal of Negro History, and the article was about slavery in um, California, which is like one of the few places, if, if not the only place, where these documents now reside, because we can't find them um, everywhere. Um, and we definitely won't find them in any one place, right? So she collected these stories about slaves brought to California. And, and this has now become a really important, um, you know, historical article. <laughs> and that includes all of this, these historical um, facts that, that, you know, historians such as myself and others need for our own work. Lindsay. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you, Anna, for all your comments and thoughts about that. They um, resonate with me a lot. And I think in learning about Delilah Beasley, um, also sort of in, you know, what Dana said about being from California and sort of learning about feeling like you're learning about California from the first, for the first time from Delilah Beasley is, was definitely my experience in reading not just Dana's story and Anna's essay, but also going, I also have like a reprinted version of Negro Trailblazers of California, which I wish I had, I could show you all. It's, you know, looks like a Xerox copy of a 1919 original publication. So like the writing is very small, you know, I, it's sort of, I mean, I feel very charmed that the book looks that way that I get to have it. And I also am so, I so admire how dense the writing is because to me, it just shows the depth of her research and how much care she put in to including all of these details um, about these people and about these events. And when you read it, even though it's incredibly dense, there's a lot of dates, there's a lot of names, there's a lot of years. It's also like she writes about these people like she knows them. And in some cases, it's because she actually spoke to them. Like she actually was sitting in a room with this naval captain or with this person's spouse, right? It's like, it is like a different level it's a different type of primary source than you're used to reading. Um, or, and, and I think it reads really differently than history books that are often written from this very outsider perspective where there's a lot of speculation. And when you read 
Delilah Beasley's work, it's like, oh, you can just feel that she was there, even in some instances when she was not, right? Um, because she wasn't there, you know, during some of the years that she documents. But as far as how it, I think, really impacts my work as someone who works with primarily high school students, um, not in classroom settings usually, but I, one of the reasons, one of the ways I got to continue to sort of engage with Dana and Anna's work um, and Delilah Beasley's work was helping to develop a curriculum guide for trailblazers. So not for Negro trailblazers of California, although there are excerpts included as like supplementary uh, media and reading, um, it's for the book for trailblazer. And as we were putting that together, it just felt like not only do I feel like people like Delilah need to be in the curriculum, especially in California and, and really nationally, um, it's also such an amazing vehicle to introduce these other histories, like these gaps, I don't even call them gaps. Gaps almost feels like an understatement, right? These other histories of California that just, you know, when in most history classes, you know, black people, you know, are introduced to you as enslaved people, maybe after the Civil War even, right? It's like, it's such an incomplete and like incomplete history, it's just riddled with all of these like time lapses. Um, and I think, you know, even hearing her, reading her chapter about the gold rush and hearing about, you know, all of the black folks that were in California during the gold rush. And in California, the gold rush is like a major unit in California schools and in elementary schools, right? It's like, fourth grade, you spend all this time talking about the missions and the gold rush. And that is not something I was ever told. Um, and so the way that Delilah Beasley impacts my work, really it's stories like hers and the stories she told that really made me want to pursue history specifically as a subject to teach um, because it's, it's, there's so little inclusion around uh, specifically black folks you know i'm going to be teaching in california so i'm thinking locally in that way but overall um so yeah i'll stop there i could talk about it forever but <laughs> yeah that's that's those are really good points and one of the things i think um lindsay that um i was gonna wait but i <laughs> i'm really interested in knowing about and and hearing about is um, how, how looking at um, these kinds of primary sources, for example, um, and the information that we get um, from these collections help inform the work that we do um, as historians, as collectors, as writers, and as teachers. And, you know, you are like at the cutting edge of, um, of teaching right now with the work that you're doing um, in education. And so how um, is this work um, like Delilah Beasley's and others? You know, we can expand the conversation a little bit, but how does that help sort of inform your teaching and, and the information and the projects? Um, these Zine projects are like the hottest thing right now um, <laughs> in education, right? Like how is it helping shape how students are learning um, about the past? I think, I mean, I think there's so many lessons from Delilah Beasley. Um, and one of the other things that I'm so inspired by with all of this history is this like self-publishing element of her story. Um, which I imagine she would have liked to have not done if, if she had an option. It's very hard to do something like that. And it was a really long book. She put a lot of time into it, you know, having to print it and publish it herself because nobody would um, is also a part of it that I think is a huge and important lesson and why I think things like zines are so important for students, you know, there's the, there's the logistical element of how liberating it can be and how inspiring it can be to just hear like, actually, yes, there were black people here during this year that you've decided only these people lived here, right? And that these histories go way back. There's also the story of Delilah Beasley that I really, that I try to, I hope comes through in some of the projects in the curriculum guide, which is really like exploding this idea of what being an academic even means and what being a professional means, right? And that 
self-publishing your work, you know, there's people, I mean, now it's like we have Amazon, right? It's like not as exciting, like you can self-publish your book on Amazon. But when you look at the roots of self-publishing, going back to like abolitionist newspapers, suffragette newspapers, I mean, it's had this political thread sort of as far as back as you can till the printing press, right? Um, and I think um, one of the ways that it informs my teaching too is this idea that, especially thinking about primary sources, right? Is that there's a lot of criteria, which on one hand, I'm glad there is criteria about what we consider to be true or factual, right? Because we've obviously had an administration recently and that's like, oh my God, like if you say something on Facebook now, it's like evidence, right? But I also think, you know, someone actually in the chat earlier I saw <laughs> made a comment about how oral histories have long since been really not regarded as something that is evidence-based, as something that's considered a primary source. And I think Delilah Beasley really bridges that gap where she's taking these oral histories and she's documenting them so that they're, I suppose, like recognizable to academia because it's in a book, but acknowledging like these are these people's words directly from them and their stories. And I think that lesson for students is important because I really, there's just so much gatekeeping around academia and who's allowed to write what and who's allowed to have an opinion. And I think youth are generally maligned for their opinions. Like, you don't know, you're still in school. You'll know when you get older, right? And we're seeing with like this Zoomer generation that there's so a, a total wealth of knowledge and that just because they don't have these academic backgrounds that we've decided are what you need to make something true, um, that perhaps we should expand our criteria for, for what that means. And yeah, sorry, I'm seeing these things in the chat and same with indigenous history, right? It's like, we talked in some of our planning conversations around this, we talked about how our understanding of evidence-based stuff is very colonial, right? It has to be in a book, it has to be peer reviewed. And it's not that those things are all bad, but it's also acknowledging that there are other ways of archiving and documenting storytelling that exist out of those outside of those um, limitations, I guess. And I think that's important for students to know, for sure. Yeah, thank you. And I think that um, this is this brings up some very important points about um, how how we tell stories. And Marnie, what... I'd like, Marnie, I'd like to say something, though, to okay. add to what's been said about Delilah and also to build on what Lindsay's saying about how we receive or perceive uh, how history is, is presented to us, how it's disseminated. I think Delilah Beasley was doing a couple of different things. And this is in uh, kind of shuttling back to uh, what Dana was talking about and, and Anna Cecilia. <clears throat> she was doing uh, two things at once, her document shows us. One, she's writing in, you know, a, a very, uh, uh, typical style of that era as far as her uh, the syntax and the, and the way she constructs her sentences and everything like that. So in that way, she was of her time. But she's also letting us know that she is working uh, with real purpose on this compilation of stories. She's ref she often says throughout the book, this writer spoke to this person. And so she's putting us in that <clears throat> moment of, of, uh, of, of harvesting history. So she's referencing herself as the documentarian of these stories, which I think is really interesting because the Academy would prefer uh, that the writer kind of stay out of it, you know, not mention oneself, and journalism was like this for a, a while too. Don't mention yourself, just tell us the story. And I, and I think what's interesting about the book and what makes the book accessible and readable is the fact that she lets us in on the fact that yes, I'm, I'm capturing this story. She refers to herself as this writer. At this time, I spoke to this person. And so it isn't history engraved in marble on a building. You know, it's the work of the historian 
in talking to, you know, I had the uh, opportunity to know this person who lived in this previous time and told me about it. And I think that's really important, uh, a really important development in <clears throat> the historiography of California, but in also the business of history. I just want to say that. No, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I was going, I was, I was moving in that direction with my question. Oh, okay. Um, but, but this is really important that you said this because um, we have talked um, about not today, but um, privately about um, when I, when I was working on um, my book and I was working on my dissertation and how my committee was saying like you rely so heavily on. Um, you know, on Delilah Beasley, and I'm and I'm saying because this is the record. This is, you know, this is where the record lies now, and um, and I think that it's really important to kind of look at both the connect, you know, the connection between collecting and storytelling, um, and so that's that's something that I wanted to ask um, ask both you. And um, and the other panelists, but also um, I wanted I want to also point out a couple of things. One is that um, this you know like oral histories and things like that um, are you know have have been recognized um, by historians um, of certain backgrounds, social historians, for example, um, and and really kind of taking the value. Of, of oral histories and things like that. Um, whereas maybe in other parts of the history, you know, field that may not be the case, um, but for at least 50 years now. So, so that's the good kind of turn in being more inclusive about um, who's, who's making history and who's accounting um, for those histories. And I think that a lot of people who had been marginalized in the past um, are beginning to come into the fold, but it's a very slow process and a very slow field, right? Um, it, it can, I mean, history, historians only, um, uh, uh, only work with what they can, what they can get, right, out of the archives um, and such. And so, so that's one of the things that I was thinking about um, in terms of how we tell stories um, and, and, and also collect um, the material for those stories, not just for historians, but also for writers. Um, and so um, you've worked with all kinds of people who are looking at this historical um, material. And I'm wondering, um, you know, how, how then um, that informs how we can continue the work of storytelling in different, you know, obviously different areas. Um, so Dorothy, you work with architects, you work with writers, you work with historians, you work with teachers, you know, and people are coming in and, um, you know, and you are also showing them all of this preserved work so that they can do the, you know, kind of preserve these histories in their various areas. Um, Dana's looking at and and Anna and Lindsay, you're looking at collections and you're telling stories, right? Um, so how do you continue that work of storytelling and collecting? Well, for me, um, the interesting thing about where I work is that it's in a public library. And so uh, we are working in a institution who's main goal is to share uh, the resources therein. And so uh, I, as you said, I work with a lot of different people, filmmakers from other countries, uh, college professors, elementary school teachers, uh, grad students, you, you name it. And um, the interesting thing about being a librarian, which is my background, not archiving, which I, incidentally got into when I got into, uh, when I started working in Oakland History Center is um, people are constantly bringing the questions to uh, the library, uh, to me. 
and to my coworkers to, um, you know, in pursuit of their own intellectual uh, or recreational interests. And so, you know, I'm not working out of a kind of a silo of information uh, as a public librarian, I'm getting questions and being inspired to build collections uh, based on all of those questions and, and find answers to all those questions. And so it's been, it, it's really interesting to have such kind of a, a broad net to cast, um, to bro a broad net to cast to ans answer questions and, and build stories. So our, our stories are as diverse and um, numerous as there are people and, and even more so actually, because there are so many questions that any one person can ask, uh, so many collections that you can build from any one person or a particular group of people. So it, it's uh, extremely broad, um, the number of stories that you can harvest. Uh, so it, it makes it both difficult and in, inspiring to uh, be confronted with, you know, having so many stories to tell. Uh, the responsibility that I feel is capturing those stories, seeing the value in those stories. How do we pass this information on to the next patron uh, who wanders into the history center or to the next a generation of students, how do we uh, reinterpret, not necessarily reinterpret, but how do we offer a different perspective on something by collecting it, having a number of people speak on it, speak on its value, you know? So, um, I mean, that's how we build collections in the first place. Someone brings something to the History Center, um, I say this is why this is important or this came up at this time, which was an important social time in our, our history. And then you just build it from there. Why is it relevant? Why was it kept? Uh, who could use it? Who will refer to it in the future? And that's how archives build uh, or establish a value. Who can use it in the future? How did it get here? Why did they let go of it and give it to us? So those are some of the questions that I address all the time in my work. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you so much. And then um, okay, Anna, go ahead. And then I have another question I'd like to ask. Yeah, I wanted to just um, kind of add to what Dorothy was saying. I mean, I think um, in in hearing you describe your work, I, I um, you know, I think we should all feel very fortunate to have um, someone like you kind of asking those questions and um, and really being, you know, that it's it's through through you that those archives are being built because, you know, something that I know um, we've talked about um, separately and something that, you know, I think, you know, Dana and I both experienced in trying to write about Delilah is that, you know, as she herself was um, creating um, this body of knowledge, um, very little of her own um, details of her own life are collected. And so, you know, this is something as, as historians, as writers, we're kind of, um, especially, you know, when what we want to research and write about are, you know, the lives of Black people. Um, in the past, we're kind of are, I think, faced with um, this challenge of finding, you know, the archive either totally lacking um, or, um, or, you know, I think even more, um, unfortunately, more commonly, like the, what is, what is collected, um, what we know of um, Black people, you know, a hundred years ago, 150 years ago are, you know, documents that are tied to, are dehumanizing, you know, it's like, and this is something we talked about yesterday. There's other um, historians like um, Sadia Hartman who kind of write a lot about kind of their um, work in, in trying to um, recover and, and um, revive kind of the memory of these ancestors um, 
with, you know, and, and the only documentation, the only thing the archive provides them are, um, are kind of um, documents of which very little um, is known about these people aside from kind of their, um, the way in which they were kind of viewed and documented as property. Um, and so I think that's, in some ways I kind of, you know, I think, I wonder if part of, you know, Delilah's own, um, her will and her passion and, and her um, need to, you know, kind of document this for herself was, was, you know, a sense that we now, you know, a hundred years later, like this is, if we didn't have this, we would have nowhere to look for these stories. And then there's this kind of like, that's over layered with the, the, the own um, kind of not, I mean, in some ways tragedy that, that um, her own, the details of her own life um, were, were kind of also lost, um, lost in time. And so I think, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not a fiction writer, so I, I think I'm generally just always um, really um, impressed, but I, I, I especially found um, with the writing that Dana did with her short story, just, um, yeah, the, the um, so it's, it seems like so much of the work we have to do now is to like recuperate and to um, place these people in, um, you know, in, in a living history where we can kind of see them as human beings, kind of like you said, like see like, who Delilah's parents were, what her childhood home was, um, you know, like what she felt when she first came to California, the kind of rich, richness of detail that she kind of offered for the stories of others. Um, I'm just very, yeah, I, I, I think reading your story, Dana, I was just so moved by how you really breathed um, life into the little, unfortunately, the little that we know about Delilah herself. Um, and the archive is just such a, yeah, it, it's a very, um, the archive that we have left is just is very um, incomplete and we're lucky to have Dorothy someone like Dorothy now kind of collecting for our descendants so they'll have something very differently hopefully to um, research and create and write from. I just want to add to Anna just you know thank you for saying that about my work but it's interesting because there's no fiction without the archives you know what I mean like there's <laughs> Um, the details, the articles that you brought back, because I wasn't able to go up to Oakland, so you researched and you found all these articles and all of these things that I then used to write the fiction. And so I was trying to excavate a kind of emotional truth because she had such a hard time writing this. Um, ill health, lack of money, all of that stuff. So. I wouldn't have been able to write about her in ways that I thought did her justice if not for the, the factual materials that came from the archive. So these two things are so married, they're, you know, they, they go together. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to add was the beautiful photographs that are in the, in the Negro Trailblazers of California. She's, you know, repositioning African Americans in a way that again takes us away from our invisibility in the state and away from sort of slave narratives of the state. So she's got, you know, lyric sopranos and prominent military figures and theater folks and actors and the little girl who uh, named the World's Fair. Like we have all of these beautiful photographs of these gorgeous dignified African Americans and that's in the in the text as well. So she's really trying to make us see like not only am I writing about these folks, but look it, this is this is who we are. And here's an evidence in this photograph, in these beautiful photographs throughout the book. I think also just to add to that quickly, like one of the things that strikes me also so much about a about Delilah's like journalism work is that there was obviously a lot of advocacy around anti-lynching campaigns and things like that. And she wrote, you know, really strongly worded pieces against, um, uh, I'm, I feel glad that I'm forgetting the name of this movie, Birth of a Nation, right? When that was being, you know, when that movie was coming out and being screened at the White House, right? Um, by a president that we remember as being really progressive, but screening this movie, right? But she also had the column Activities Among Negroes that was, 
a lot of these things that we don't get to see documented about Black people a lot, which is like a visitor is coming to town, right? Someone has an uncle that's visiting Oakland. Maybe not something that would always be considered newsworthy, you know, which is something that Dorothy touched on earlier. Um, someone's graduating, right? These announcements that really, again, humanized this community in Oakland, these Black folks that are like, it's, it's, it's resisting the sort of tragedy narrative and it's also making sure to highlight not just the most exceptional. It's also like all of these things, all of these like daily activities and celebrations, birthdays, family members coming from out of town, like all of those she made sure to capture as being really, you know, being worthy of being documented and remembered. And I think we don't have, you know, not all black folks. I mean, black folks are like very enthusiastic, like home recorders in my family experience. So there are like videos of birthdays and old, my grandparents have kept like every photo and receipt they've ever had. And we have in that way, a lot of self archiving and documenting, but um, you know, you don't often get to look at old newspaper reels and see things like that about black people. Um, and so I think that's, an a, incredibly valuable thing too that she gave to us. Another thing, she broadened our lens on what people in California, their relationships with people outside of California. One thing she did that was really important that was uh, something that the Pullman Porters were doing uh, in a different way. Uh, she would travel around the country uh, attending uh, different conferences, conventions, meetings, uh, she sat in a lot of, uh, on a lot of boards. Um, and, uh, you know, she was part of the California Federation of Colored Women's Club. And uh, she would travel around the country and learn about what else, what other black communities were doing in other parts of the country. All of that served us when she came back because she reported on those things. Um, political movements, uh, things having to do with uh, uh, voting rights, legislation, as you mentioned, pertaining to lynching. And so all of that helped to inform not only her column, but the community here in the East Bay and throughout California. So uh, the black newspapers were very much in league with each other Delilah, before she started writing for the Trib, she was writing for the Oakland Sunshine, which was Oakland's black newspaper. And so um, our black newspapers throughout the uh, country, the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh uh, Courier, uh, those kinds of newspapers were certainly carrying African-American news stories. Uh, and Delilah was certainly part of that network um, of information. So she's kind of realigning the territory about what is historically significant, uh, what's worth reporting, what's worth recording and, and, and keeping. So I, th I think it was really interesting, um, her work with the newspapers for sure. Yeah. Um, thank you um, for that, Dorothy, and thank you um, to the panelists. So far, um, we've we've covered a lot of ground, and there's way more to go. But I would like to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions of the panelists. Um, so, if you would like. To ask a question, please drop it into either the chat or the Q and A, and we are monitoring um, that very closely. Um, and we should be able to get to your question um, as quickly as possible. And while you are doing that, I think it'd be a good time now, since we're having this um, conversation in this forum in this way. And I love that Lindsay refer referred to. Uh, the Generation Zoomers, because who would have thought that Generation Z really meant <laughs> Generation Zoom, mm -hmm. um, fortunately or unfortunately. But I would like to um, maybe kind of shift into the digital age and talk about how we are, um, you know, preserving history in the digital age. Um, and what that looks like. And I know that someone has asked a question, um, not so much for the panelists about, 
you know, getting to the archive, getting to the Autry specifically to do some research. But what does that look like? Um, and that's really a COVID question, but what does it look like um, for the digital age? Should I pick someone to start? I'll start, <laughs> Dorothy, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's gonna be a challenge. Um, like with all physical archives, uh, you know, with three dimensional materials in them, uh, it's a challenge to both find and preserve things uh, and catalog things uh, so that they will be made available to uh, future visitors, future archivists, or students of archives, or students of history. Um, so it's, um, I think what's going to be most challenging during this period is how do we uh, preserve things that are born digital? Where do we store those records? How do we provide access and maintain access to those uh, materials that are digital? Not everything that's on the internet, we were talking about this yesterday, the, the group, uh, everything we encounter that is digital online doesn't necessarily, is nev not necessarily going to last uh, for an unknown amount of time. So that's something, that's work that archivists now have to do. How do we do, how do we manage digital archiving? Um, in, in places where archives exist, it, will there be um, will there be enough money, enough resources, enough technological skill to uh, maintain, to build and maintain um, a digital archive? So that's something that we have to address in Oakland Public Library, as all libraries have to address. Do we have enough? Uh, bandwidth, uh, staffing, money to preserve things and to allow those archives to grow. That's something that uh, everyone who has an archive is faced with or works in archive is faced with. Uh, will we, if we have a digital presence of our digital resources, things that have been digitized like our photos in the Oakland History Center, um, how will we continue to grow those collections? How will we maintain those collections in the future as more and more um, uh, media changes? You know, we went from paper to uh, audio, audio tape and videotape and then CDs and so forth. So uh, we have to keep uh, always pivoting to the next, um, material next format I should say so uh, it's going to be a challenge I don't have the technical skills to uh, imagine what it will be next but um, yeah it's something that we all are going to fa be faced with mm -hmm. yeah um, I'm, I'm wondering um, Lindsay I want to start with you I'm wondering about um, how this impacts um, the classroom, because it, it does, it does seem um, like a lot of the work that you are involved in is very much, um, um, not only is it the historical and archival, but it's also the digital and how it translates. So um, how does your work um, deal with or handle um, the digital age for um, teaching history? In California? Um, that is a really good question that I probably would answer better once I'm actually teaching history in a classroom formally. So I'm not doing that yet. But, you know, I. Workshopping then. Yeah. <laughs> Workshop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think I have a really, I think it is kind of a luxury and a privilege. And it's it has its own challenges, but it's, you know, being able to work with youth outside of a classroom space has given me a lot of flexibility about like what media I can use as text for our conversations and the things we can talk about. And, um, you know, obviously every youth program this year, the past year has been on Zoom. So we've been sort of nudged very forcefully into having to embrace digital 
resources and stuff um, in, in a bigger way. I really do like to incorporate like printed materials into the workshops and the programs that I do. Um, like I'm, since I'm a zine maker, I love making zines with them. I love making them as resource materials. So I'm still very beholden to the printed object for things like that. Um, but, you know, I look at, I mean, I think like, I just think often in, in all, when I think about the students that I work with, sort of a driving thing for me is always like, how can I let them make more decisions? And how can I let the young people I work with make more choices and like really, really shape our time together, right? So it's like acting as a supportive facilitator, but really letting them kind of steer the ship in, in, in ways that feel good to them. And I think when I think about this quandary of like, how do we, like there's already so much history that is like, we don't know where it is, you know, in some of our conversations preparing for this panel, you know, Dorothy was like, I know there's things out there. There's things in people's closets and people's suitcases and in, you know, in garages that are like valuable letters or signed things like they're out there, but we just, we can't, we don't know how to find them. And then the things that we do have, you know, aren't widely digitized, but I think when thinking about how do we embrace the digital age, you know, I think we have to figure out a way to, to bring young people in in a lot more intention, in an intentional way. And I think, you know, there's, you know, being not every young person is like gonna wanna go to school to become a researcher or an archivist. That's not necessarily an accessible field to a lot of young people. But I think introducing the concept of what archiving means at a younger age, I mean, that would have blown my mind as a young person. You know, I didn't know what that was. I didn't ever think of being someone that could do those things. And now I know that like my, I now am in possession of really amazing documents from my family that I didn't know existed. And, you know, if I'd been asked to look for things like that at a younger age and figured out, you know, they know their way around digital stuff. I mean, I'm just like, school should just be documenting like all of these amazing TikToks that I see. I mean, it's amazing. It's like amazing historical footage is being documented through these channels. And I think um, we talk about it sort of jokingly because it is kind of funny, but it's also like very powerful. And we've seen them take down like an entire Trump rally with TikTok. So I think not to give TikTok credit because I'm not trying to give like a, an app any credit, but the, the users of TikTok, these young people, primarily young black indigenous youth of color that are really using these systems in really innovative ways, you know, perhaps they just need to be a part of the conversation, not as an afterthought, but, you know, as we think of ways to, to move into the digital age and, and archive, you know, mm -hmm. things. Thank you. But I think also, Lindsay, we need to teach the youth what can be included in an archive. You know, some people think it needs to be an old dusty book or papers or letters, correspondences or something like that. Doesn't have to be that. Uh, certainly now we are in an in a age where things that were, you know, videos and, um, you know, things that you shot with, on your phone are salvageable, are, are part of an archive and definitely will be part of a future documentation of our times. So I think if we just, if all those of us who work with students can talk about the various things that have been in archives, there's a, a fairly famous book came out, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, uh, The History of the World in a Hundred Objects. And that kind of really broadened for uh, users uh, or readers of that book what can what can be salvaged? What can tell a story uh, of a past time or a place? Uh, everything from you know ticket stubs to uh, personal letters to postcards, you know, all kinds of ephemera, um, and and in this case, TikTok videos or YouTube videos about you know your dog or or something like that. Anything that could speak to a time, which is almost anything that humans can engage in, can be considered part of an archive. I think that's a really crucial point, and it really is about 
which has I think been kind of a theme in this conversation about Delilah too, which is like what counts as history, right? Mm -hmm. What counts as something that's important? What counts as something that needs, that should be revisited and remembered and, you know, documented. So mm -hmm. I think that's true. I don't know, maybe we should bring back time capsules as school projects or something. I don't know if people do that anymore, but so on some level there's like capturing a moment in time or a year in the life had there is like a thing in that especially in schools that is like exciting or something or a lot of students write a letter to themselves and seal it and then get it a year later like there's projects like that that are a part of our schooling system anyway so I do wonder like being able to have like an archiving elective or something at a school you know I think could be really it powerful. It would be a great way to teach history it would yeah. be a great way to teach history because people always think history is like Abraham Lincoln, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, right. A lot of dead people, but history is <laughs> happening every day. Yeah. You know, and it's not just about today or is history two weeks right. from now. And it's not just about like exceptional individuals, right? It's about movements and groups and communities and events, right? It's about the more like interconnected history. It's not just about these like top five amazing noteworthy you know individual men <laughs> usually it's, it's like which is how history has been taught to us you, you yeah. know you mentioned the fourth grade curriculum and uh, and that fourth grade curriculum is it's all about guys they're all white uh they're dead history stops and then you jump up 100 years and then there's some more guys you know and so what's amazing about delilah Delilah's work that she left us is that she's letting us know history is for everybody and history involves everybody. I think so, she really appreciated that. Yeah, these are excellent, excellent points. And it dovetails into um, a, a question from the audience, which was um, a statement and a question. We need more models to teach outside the gated world of teaching history in schools. Um, and so where and what are some resources related to the black experience in Los Angeles? So if you're thinking about, um, you know, how to teach the black experience, I think we've, I think we've touched on it. We got a few um, really good ideas um, from this conversation, but is there anything else that anyone would like to add about where they might find resources? Well, talking to people, you know, one of the things that researchers forget sometimes is the human resource. You know, people look for books, they look for newspaper articles and, and so forth, all the printed uh, representations of history. But people in our communities are carrying around an enormous amount of history, remembering things, holding on to those stories. Maybe they've written those stories down, true enough, or filmed them in, in a home movie, or, or they were involved in a community organization that played a part in that history that people are trying to capture. So I would say, certainly use your uh, library and archival resources, but also reach out to people, ask neighbors, well, what was this neighborhood like if you're doing neighborhood history or a church history? Um, ask an elder at your church, what, what was this like? What was this community like? Uh, you know, communities change identities uh, over time. Uh, and so talk to elders, record what they say, uh, if it's okay with them. Uh, but there are a number of resources that you could use. Yeah, there's um, a comment um, from Morgan Harrison who says we are limited in certain ways by the pandemic, but at the same time, youth have an opportunity to listen to their parents and grandparents' stories um, and that they could even record um, some of those stories um, so that they um, are learning um, all kinds of things about their own history and broadening their understanding. Um, and, and I think that also is a good opportunity for students 
um, and for um, that work to eventually be archived. Um, so let me see, there was another question about Delilah Beasley's book, um, and that is um, how widely was Delilah Beasley's book distributed and was it suppressed from being published? I don't know if it was so much suppressed as um, just rejected uh, by publishers. Um, I haven't heard of its suppression at all. I haven't heard that story or run across that story, uh, which is what led her to self-publish it. Correct, yeah. Um, and another question um, from the audience um, and this is from uh, Florence Rosen, who teaches memoir uh, writing um, about archival centers in Los Angeles. Where are the archival centers in Los Angeles? So I thought maybe, I don't know, um, Dana, if you had an opportunity to tap into those centers um, before writing about Delilah Beasley, but I wanted to, to give you an opportunity. Your, yeah. Uh, no, I did not. Like again, I I owe a huge debt to Anna Cecilia because um, she went and brought all this stuff back to me, um, and it was amazing. A lot of stuff to wade through and try to decide what was important for me to uh, to say in the story. Um, but no, I I was lucky that way. I did not get to go myself. And I mean, I'll add, I mean, I, I went to the, you know, now Oakland History Center and met Dorothy <laughs> and asked, you know, what um, she had um, in terms of Delilah Beasley. Um, and, but actually a lot of like one of the main, so there's maybe been like, I found two um, academic um, articles written by historians in the last like 20 or so years about Delilah. Um, one of them um, was by a historian. I think she is in Louisiana, um, Elsa Barkley Brown, who wrote an introduction to, I believe, like a, a reprint of Trailblazers and kind of did, she, she kind of did a lot of her own research. There's another um, kind of more like journalism, history, um, academic who wrote about Delilah's journalism. But the main, main resource that I used um, was a book written by a Bay, Bay Area historian um, whose name is Lorraine Crochet, um, who I think, she, I mean, really like she, she is, oh, I think everyone else who's written about Delilah since her is really indebted to her um, research and she wrote a very short biography on Delilah that um, was tricky to find. I had to actually ask um, my boyfriend to go. He's in um, he's doing his PhD at Berkeley and like Berkeley's library was like the only place that I could really access it. So even I like had to you know find a way to get my hands on this book. But um, Lorraine describes literally going. Um, you know, what, what we know about Delilah's childhood, Delilah was born in Cincinnati, um, is we know it because Lorraine drove to the, um, you know, the records of Cincinnati and sat, you know, and just read records of, you know, um, you know, births and deaths of families um, in Cincinnati around the time that um, Delilah was born and like found her name in that record and like recovered that detail. Um, and so that's the thing I feel like when you're really in, in some ways that the, the work of researching and working through archives is so, un, you know, in some ways it's so unglamorous or, you know, it's just, it's very much just like combing and like looking for, I mean, that's, that's the work of the historian is really just like getting into, um, you know, the archive and just like kind of looking for those tidbits. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, deeply ends up being deeply meaningful and deeply valuable um, to the recover that. And, and yeah, and, and thanks to, you know, the work, the hours that Lorraine spent kind of like pouring 
um, herself into that archive, you know, do we know about who Delilah's parents were, um, you know, where she was born and these other kind of details. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah. The Jake yeah. Cruchet book and also the uh, Barclay Brown book or th those materials were just amazing for me. Um, they really helped me paint a portrait. It really helpful. I remember Anna Cecilia, you I think you like took pictures of stuff like, cause you couldn't, it was really amazing how you got all that stuff, so. Um, so I just, I just wanna double back uh, the person, uh, pr someone in the Q and A asked, uh, how was Delilah's book uh, distributed or was it well received? What was the question? I felt like I didn't answer it. Yeah, uh, the, the question was um, about distribution and also whether it was um, suppressed by the publisher. But um, as was mentioned, it was a self-published um, yeah. book. And so uh, she she wanted there to be uh, copies in every library in California, um, as was the case with her own personal life. There was a, she, her publishing was also thwarted by, um, you know, lack of funds. So um, she didn't. It wasn't as widely distributed, but it was well received by people. Uh, Carter G. Woodson, notwithstanding. Uh, but her book was um, touted as a really important book by the American Library Association when it came out in 1919, um, which was a, a, a feat considering how few um, books by Black authors were being recognized in that way. Thank you. That's, that's really important. I also wanted to go back to the question about the um, finding resources um, on LA um, African American history, because this was a really difficult task for me when I was writing my book. A lot of the information um, um, had, had, it was just difficult to find, right? And I had to go into the census and create my own database because I didn't really know who the people in the neighborhoods were and where the neighborhoods were. Um, so I got a lot of information just out of combing the, sense, the census um, indices. But um, the, as um, Catherine Adams mentions in um, the comments that LA County Public Library or LA County Library has a Black Resource Center and um, you can also find um, archives for local publications such as the Los Angeles Sentinel. You can find the California Eagle on um, online for a certain chunk of dates, which is amazing, um, which became the LA Sentinel later on. The LA um, Public Library has a social science room that has a good collection of African American um, stories in it. A lot of histories are located there, along with a great picture collection. Um, but I also had to travel to Northern California and go to the state archives and um, I'm sorry that I missed the Oakland um, <laughs> library, uh, but I'm going to be using it in the future. Um, there's lots of information there. You, it's, not, it's not that there's a, um, a one place kind of uh, contained, uh, you know, LA, Black LA history. So you have to be willing to travel um, up and down throughout the state um, to get to get some of this information. I, I oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna add another resource um, from Dana that is, was really important for me. I included it in the curriculum guide that we developed for Trailblazer is Dana's story, uh, the story of Biddy Mason. If you're looking for black resources about black people in LA, definitely a black LA pioneer. Um, I it's a really, it's a great short story for like a high school classroom if you wanted to have, um, to include that, I think that would be really amazing. It's beautiful. And there's a lot of great mentions of like LA landmarks and downtown LA. And um, that would be a really good resource, I think, too. Thank you, Lindsay. And you reminded me that Biddy Mason is actually in the Negro Trailblazers of California. <laughs> so Delilah Beasley was uh, wanted to be sure that we knew about her, too. 
And I just, um, one thing Julia reminded me of in the chat was the difficulty we had, the irony of someone who was so thorough with history herself, with dates and people and documenting, documenting everyone, that when we were putting this book together, we could not figure out her actual birth and death dates. And Julia, I forgot, I mean, and Anna Cecilia, I forgot how we figured that out, but that was really hard to do. And, and in a lot of ways, heartbreaking that this woman who worked so hard to document other people's lives, her life uh, was very slippery in terms of how, when she lived and when she died. So do you remember how we figured that out? I mean, I think it's, it's, and I mentioned it in my essay, it's like in, or I don't know if I do, but it's, it's inconclusive. And I think there's a discrepancy from like what is included, I believe in, in the census record. And then also what's on her tombstone. So it's, we don't really know um, when she was born. And I think we, you know, there's, um, yeah, I think we kind of went for one date. Um, but yeah, I think that that kind of proves to the point, like you said, that she, that um, there is, there is this almost like um, tragedy or just kind of, it, it's, it's telling that the, the details of her own life kind of have been um, hard to pin down, even while she tirelessly was trying to capture these details um, about others. But, um, but yeah, that's something that um, we and other um, you know, researchers of Delilah have found that we're not even sure um, the exact year when she was born. I think the um, it's either 1867 or 1871, um, but it's not conclusive. Which there's um, yeah, there's kind it of contradicting though, records. It was fiction because I was trying so hard to be accurate about this is very important. This is her. This is her life. So it was really kind of scary and frustrating to not really know those exact dates. I think I land, we landed on a date for when she died because my story ends with her dying in the hospital there. So we yeah. just went with that, yeah. August 18th, 1934. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. yeah, right. I, I, I wanna get back a little bit to, uh, or I want to add uh, something about Delilah's writing as uh, a person who was taking, you know, the recording and preservation of African American history seriously. Uh, her mission, this was her activism, her writing, her recording this history was her activism. And I think it, it's important to share a little story about her. Uh, she attended the International Council of Women Conference in Washington, D.C., and I, I'm forgetting the date. I want to say it was in the 20s, but I'm not really sure at this point. But the, the point of it is that she uh, got together with a bunch of fellow journalists who were also in attendance at the conference, and she really advocated for them to stop using derogatory terms in when writing about black people, you know, pickaninny, nigger, uh, burrhead, all of those words that were fairly common in our press and even in our histories at that time, uh, she asked them uh, to please stop using that term. And she knew that it, you know, words had um, Significant, significant meaning and impact on people, how they thought of themselves and how others thought of us. And so I think, uh, you know, we're still uh, fighting that fight in, in many uh, areas um, of how we wanna be addressed, not just African-American people, but other people as well, how we wanna be addressed. Uh, we see it in our sports teams, you know, it's still a fight that's going on. And I think uh, she was one of the earliest uh, people I've run across to actually ask a group of colleagues, professional colleagues, to, um, to stop that practice. And, and several people did. And, and most importantly, the people in Oakland, uh, the Tribune in Oakland, stopped using the terms. Mm -hmm. So 
that's another important contribution she made. And well, oh, go, sorry. I was gonna yeah, add one yeah. final de detail to that is that not only did she kind of ask, you know, that these terms not be used, but then she specified, you know, instead like, uh, you know, you can address us as Negroes. And she really was specific about having the N capitalized, which is such a nice, like I say, it's such a kind of like telling detail. And also just, I mean, yeah, it's still relevant, the conversations happening around now around having um, Black capitalized in publications. Um, yeah, so we're still very, um, very, like that work continues, but I just love that detail about her. That's <laughs> At this Marty, time, can, um, Marty, can I suggest one thing to the audience? Absolutely. Archive.org has a digital version of uh, Negro Trailblazers of California. Um, so you can get it for free on archive.org. That's the Internet Archives website. They have a lot of digitized books, hers being one of the more important ones, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to let people know that. Thank you so much for that. That's very important. And, um, and those who um, will read it after today will find that you can never stop finding information in this book about um, California's African-American history. So um, at this point, I'd like to stop. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for this wonderful, wonderful discussion. And um, and I think at this point, do I, I don't, should I turn it over to <laughs> Julia for any final comments? Sure, thank you so much, Marnie. And thank you also everyone who contributed today. It's, it's wow, it's been a year. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm getting all emotional, but um, it was just nice to have this happen. So thank you because we didn't get to do it last March and it's not as great to be here on Zoom, but it definitely is amazing to have this event. So thank you. Buy the book. Thank you, Delilah. Thanks everyone. All right, bye-bye. Take good care, everybody.